extraordinary <laughs> revelation today. The COVID inquiry is on track to become the most expensive in British history of inquiries. It's costing the taxpayer at least, and this is mind-blowing, £300,000 a day over the last year. Look, we knew it was going to take a long time. We knew it was set up too late. We know the remit for it is is very questionable. Um, uh, and we don't seem to be getting to the bottom of many things. Information has come out, but as far as I can tell, most of the, the councils for the inquiry are more concerned about someone sending a nasty WhatsApp about Boris Johnson and calling him a, a silly name than they are about actually getting to the truth about what was the evidence for the policies that you did that completely devastated our nation's health and our finances and our civil liberties? They don't seem to care so much about that. Um, what do you make of that cost and what the COVID inquiry is actually achieving? I think it's completely structured wrongly. It should have been a medical scientific inquiry. It should have been a doctor in charge, an experienced evidence, an analytical doctor that would look at it from a medical view. What do we all want from it? We're paying a huge amount, 300,000 a day. Just imagine what you could do with that for a long period of time, mainly to lawyers and civil servants. That's where it's going. They're not going to produce a plan for do, dealing with it again. They're just going to look at the, the tittle-tattle that you mentioned, the WhatsApp, the position, who is in charge, who is in... All these people are nobody in five years' time. They've gone. They've, most of them are nobody now, of course, including <laughs> the Prime Minister. Oh, for goodness sake, let's be honest. So uh, if you look forward... We need to have a plan not to do the same thing again. Yeah. And that has to be a medical scientific decision mm -hmm. rather than a, looking at what's happened. Some of the amazing stories, which you love and we yeah. all love. Oh, yeah, put them on the front of the papers, that's fine. But that's not what the inquiry is supposed to be doing. And again, we had this abject failure of there was no cost-benefit analysis. There was no scientific uh, 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 basis to an awful lot of the policies like mask mandates, like closing schools and uh, and it even, you know, lockdown. Again, it was going against every bit of establishment Established scientific uh, advice on on how you dealt with a pandemic, uh, and yet we did it anyway. Uh, we need to have a scientific analysis because I'm amazed by how many people want to kind of forget it happened. They're like, oh, why are you still going on about it? It happened. It's in the past. Don't worry, because there will be another pandemic. It's a when, not an if. Uh, we've got the World Health Organization. I mean, our government apparently quite happy to sign up to hand over. It was bad enough that the government had those powers over us, but they want to hand over those powers to the World Health Organization to decide if we lock down or have masks mandates or closed schools and and what vaccines we can take and the like that is even more terrifying to me and it is going to happen again and 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 the urge from not just politicians world health organization but also medics uh, and indeed the media as well to sort of see everything as a panic and everything as a pandemic um and every possible potential risk and oh oh do we need to lock down what about climate it really concerns me that if we don't learn the lessons properly from the last one we're going to do the same thing again. Exactly. And so knowing how much personal responsibility there is compared to state responsibility, do you call the police when someone leaves their home? That's the sort of state responsibility. If you start enacting that, you have to have jolly good evidence that you're breaking democracy, yeah. allowing, making people do things they wouldn't normally do and not choose to do. No one cares if people want to put Ebola-type costumes on and walk around the street when they go outside. No one cares. If they want to wear a mask, that's fine. That's their choice. But once you mandate this stuff, including yeah. vaccines and so on, you're in a different league. Yeah. And that's where we need to address the problem. And that's the interface between the law and the government and yeah. But, it, but again, also, I, I see, it still it does bother me when I see people in masks because largely it's people. I mean, I've seen young people in the middle well, in open air, and it absolutely breaks my soul to see it because they've actually been terrified by government paid for, you know, taxpayer paid for government propaganda into believing they are at risk and also that their mask will save them when the evidence is very clear and the government knew all along that a mask wouldn't make a difference at all. And I find it absolutely extraordinary that they've still allowed that to go on. I don't see any evidence that the government ever had admitted what we did was wrong we didn't have the evidence for it we apologize and we won't do it again i need to have that statement otherwise i'll never trust them
I, you won't get it, Julie. I know. It's not the kind. <laughs> and uh, we can't move on. And you're right. You go in the streets. Even still, people are wearing masks. Even still, people cross the road when you're going on the same side of the road to avoid your airspace. You know this sort of thing. Uh, and the fear is being induced by specific psychological operations. Yeah. During they the, did it. It was a deliberate. Laura Dosworth wrote a brilliant book about this in a state of fear. Exactly. It was a deliberate policy to to scare us because apparently we weren't scared enough. No. We we were being rational, were we not? Um, Philip, um, let's, let's also talk ab about, um, you know, we've got Sue Gray, by the way, giving evidence today. Apparently nothing particularly uh, explosive in anything she's had to say. Uh, she, of course, was uh, the, the woman investigator of Partygate, now works as chief of staff uh, to Keir Starmer. Um, but, um, you know, we've got, we've got pledges from Keir Starmer today in terms of cutting NHS waiting times. That is one of the key pledges from uh, Rishi Sunak going into the next general election as well, expected in the autumn. Um, you've been talking about risk to cancer patients since I mean March April 2020 you were I remember you were on my show raising the issue that the NHS had shut down to cancer yeah. patients you were right then you're right now failure to use the resources that we've got like in the private sector for, you know, for otherwise NHS patients waiting a ridiculous amount of time more than half of NHS patients who have been referred to a cancer specialist for urgent treatment waiting more than two months that is that is I mean criminal in my view criminal be no some of these people will die as a result of not getting their treatment uh, soon enough. What more can be done by any politician, by anybody in the NHS, to ensure that we do not see people dying of cancer when we can cure them and allow them to live? You know, it really is a conundrum. The only way we can deal with this is to pay existing staff to work longer hours. That's the only way. No time to train, no time to build. We're in a real crisis. We did it for the vaccine programme. If you remember, people were paid to go and come to sports grounds and yeah. shoot people up with drugs. And we had volunteers making tea. Why not the same effort that we had then? But it's that cancer, not COVID, Carol. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's that's, just, that's the message, isn't it? I know, I know. But people will take legal action in there. If you have to wait six months to get your cancer treated, as several people are at the moment, you're going to sue. You're going to say, this is totally unfair. And, and money's not going to do much for you because you're not going to survive. But by the way, you know, people say, well, you know, this is what happens after COVID. Again, no, it's what happens when you shut down the NHS to everything that's non-COVID. Again, people say, oh, are people in the NHS are working so hard. No, vast majority of people who get the NHS, unless you were working on the COVID, Wars were, were sitting around twiddling their fingers. I know people who were sitting in the hospital saying that. People A&E getting, you know, six people coming in on a Friday night, for goodness sake. But, but all, crucially, this is not happening to anything like the same extent in other countries. In other European countries, had exactly the same sort of death toll as us, exactly the same issues. They did not shut down their health service in the same way and they're not facing the same waiting list. I mean, the, the, the long-term problem is a complete reform of the NHS mm. to get it away from this bureaucratic monster that it's become and change it completely. But in the short term, all we can do, if people are waiting three months for a critical test for cancer, such as a scan, let's get the hospital's car park full at weekends. Yep. Let's pay people to do those scans yep. and get it moved. And Labour, you know, West Streeting, the, the, the shadow minister, he seems sensible in what he proposed. Use the private sector, just yep. pay for it yep. to get just get it done. It saves lives. Thank you so much for joining us, Carol Sakura from the uh, Rutherford Cancer Centre. Quick word from Philip Ingram on that. Uh, I, you know, I think the inquiry. I thought he's had cancer treatment. Uh, yes, but I, I think the, I think the inquiry is just missing the whole thing. It, it has to be a scientific approach to learn the scientific lessons, not tit -tattle not, on not the tit tattle, not the political lessons. I think that